Hi there, Sonia here. Welcome back to another episode of my Help I Am Artist podcast. I am super passionate to see artists succeed and I want to help you build a solid foundation in your life and in your art so that you can create with more confidence, have more fun, make consistent work that impacts not only your audience but generates a healthy income while living the life you love. This episode is the first of a two-part series. The first part we will look at the fascinating role of the artist through history. Theodore Roosevelt once said, the more we know about our past, the better prepared we are for the future. And in my opinion, not only prepared for the future, but this insight will give us truths and tools for today. In the second episode of the two-part series, I will show you how certain myths and misconceptions concerning artists and their roles in society today are still influencing us today. You will be able to see why cultures have adopted certain mindsets about art and the role of the artists. Why maybe your family responds in a certain way when you tell them that you are an artist or why your school values art or why they don't. These mindsets are set firm in our history and if we want to change this we first need to see where they originate. At the end of the second episode I have made a worksheet. This worksheet is available for you to download. It will help you unravel the myths that are probably keeping you from being the artist you were meant to be. So make sure you don't miss next week's episode. When I was a teenager, my father occasionally would pick me up from school. He would wait outside the school gates until I was finished with my sports or with my classes. As I approached his car, I was already planning how I was going to get into his car as quickly as possible. You see, my father loved music and he would use these times of waiting in the car to enjoy a beautiful concerto. Bach and Mozart and Chopin to name but a few. He would sit in the car and have the radio up so loud, I mean like really loud, that the car would tremble as the bass drums boomed and the horns bellowed. When you are 13, this is just not cool. Hence the reason for my quick entrance and with the door quickly closed, I would duck in my seat and tell my dad, Drive, drive, dad! Hoping nobody had heard or seen the symphony rocking my dad's Ford Sierra. Unfortunately, my dad passed away a few years ago. But my dad was an artist. As a teen, he grew up in war-torn The Hague in the Netherlands, where there was little space, time or money for music or for art. And he had no formal training, but he loved to play the piano. He never played in public, but when we would leave the house, he would open the piano and start to play. He couldn't read a word of music, but he just played from his heart and it was just so beautiful. I still see a vivid image of my mom, myself, my brother and sister standing outside his window just to hear him play. As an immigrant to South Africa, he chose to pursue a technical career in order to take care of his family. But I often wonder what he could have accomplished if he had had the opportunities, the classes and the learning possibilities we have today. One of the most prestigious films to date must be Amadeus. It's a costume drama released in 1984 that won 43 awards including 8 Oscars. The movie is set in Vienna, Austria and tells the story of Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. It sketches a romantic image of an artist, a child prodigy and a genius. His father was a composer for the courts in Austria and had written books about playing the violin. In the movie we see the rivalry between Salieri, a fellow composer. 
a mesmerizing scene in the movie, shows a blindfolded Mozart as a child playing the piano flawlessly to kings and to popes. The movie claims that Mozart composed his first concerto at four years old. In the film we see Salieri toiling relentlessly on his compositions, reworking them again and again. When he discovers that Mozart created impeccable first drafts with no sign of editing or revisions, Salieri is awestruck and green with envy. The film is based on letters published by a German music magazine in 1815. In these letters, Mozart explains his composition process as follows. Provided I'm not disturbed, my subject enlarges itself. My subject becomes methodized and defined and becomes a whole. Though it may be long, stands almost finished and complete in my mind, so that I can survey it, like a fine picture or a beautiful statue, just in a glance. Nor do I hear in my imagination the parts successively, but I hear them, as it were, all at once. This letter became the cornerstone of the myth that grew around Mozart, the brilliant composer that did not have to toil for his musical ideas, but he was handed them by a higher power. There's one problem with these letters. The letter was a forgery. Oops! The portrait of Mozart's inspired brilliance came about as a result of an overly ambitious publisher trying to sell his music magazines. However, the myth had taken hold and for hundreds of years this misconception is ingrained. The reality tells a totally different story. Mozart explains in letters that he worked for hours and that his concertos were the fruit of long and laborious effort. There's evidence that he made numerous sketches, many rough drafts, and that it was simply not true that he could hear the entire piece in his head, as there's evidence that shows that he wrote down the music notes while sitting at his piano, which means he really had to hear the notes before writing them down. His first concerto was not at four, but actually at 17, which I admit is still very, very young. But he already had 14 years of diligence and sometimes grueling training behind him, under his father's watchful eye. By many, Mozart is believed to be a genius, yet others would describe him as a madman. Whatever the case, we still enjoy his magnificent music today. Let's have a brief look at how the image of the artist evolved through history. Now you may have fallen asleep during the history lessons at school, but please bear with me. Once we know where the image of the artist originates, we can truly decipher the myths clouding our artist's heart. Much of our modern day perspectives on art and the image of the artist finds their roots way back to the early Greeks. Plato, a Greek philosopher, considered an artist to be the one imitating the reality that God created. The artist was an imitator. He copied. The word that Greeks used to describe an artist's work was mimesis, which means to imitate. Plato continued to say about poetry, These lovely poems are not of man or human workmanship, but they are divine. They are from the gods, and that poets are nothing but interpreters of the gods, each one possessed by divinity to whom he is in bondage. The Greeks and Plato embedded the idea that artists are different from the rest of us. They are of a higher status, living in a glorified state, a state unattainable to us mere mortals. Plato calls the state that poets into in order to create art a state of delirium. Artists are divinely inspired as a result of manic spiritual possession. So this early thought was that artists imitated. They imitated the reality that God created. 
not in and of themselves, but they were mere copiers. They made mimesis, an imitation. Today artists are heroes. We have living legends such as Justin Bieber or Banksy or Beyoncé. However, in the Middle Ages, it was a whole different story. We artists to the Greeks were merely imitators, copying God's reality with no red carpet treatment. In the Middle Ages, art was typically created in a workshop and made as a result of a collective effort. Most art pieces were unsigned and definitely not original. Instead, artists adhered to strict guidelines by imitating the reoccurring political and religious arts required by churches or civic organizations. Artists were skilled workers but had nothing more divine than that. You could compare them to today's bricklayers or carpenters. In the Middle Ages, trade opened up to a world economy, bringing great prosperity to Europe and the art market exploded. The rising class of merchants were eager to spend their wealth and to live like kings and noblemen. They wanted to decorate their palaces and their churches and wanted com to commission art frescoes and sculptures and poems and concertos. This increase in the desire of art resulted in two significant changes in the art world in the West. The enormous influx of economy and the rising status of merchants empowered the artists. The interest in art and the recognition gave arts the taste of power. They formed guilds that stipulated work conditions or determined the prices of the art and they developed new techniques and used new tools. In the guilds the artists could bargain for better prices. This elevated the artist to a higher level and the artist became more influential and started to prosper. Many artists even split up from the guilds and started working directly under patronage. This newfound wealth of the patrons and their great desire for art led to the onset of the Italian Renaissance. Artists were no longer individuals, but they became famous artists. Artists like Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo emerged. Their work was coveted and artists were viewed as superior. The Last Judgment is considered to be the greatest masterpiece of Michelangelo's mature years. It was commissioned by Pope Paul III and required the removal of some earlier frescoes and two windows over the altar of the Sistine Chapel in Rome. A brand new wall was erected which slanted slightly inwards so dust could not settle on it. Michelangelo worked alone on the frescoes for seven long years and finally in 1541 it was completed. Biagio was an aide to the Pope and had to oversee the project. Biagio let out a gasp of horror when the scaffolding was finally removed and the frescoes of Michelangelo were revealed. He saw that Michelangelo had painted the characters unashamedly naked. Biagio was appalled and he called the painting fit for a brothel. This in turn infuriated Michelangelo. He alone had decided that he would strip the saints and that he would not be bullied by a bureaucrat. He decided to take revenge by adding an extra figure to the painting. Biagio, the official, an aide to the Pope, was now portrayed as Minos, the judge of the dead. In the notes of the podcast, I will add an illustration of the painting. If you look closely, you will see Biagio standing at the right-hand bottom corner, totally naked, with a snake wrapped around him twice. Now it is Biagio's turn to be furious. He stormed off to the Pope to complain but the Pope refused to intervene. Michelangelo enjoyed and demonstrated his newfound power of a celebrity artist. He was even capable of standing up to high-ranking religious officials. 
A good friend of Michelangelo was Giorgio Vasari, an Italian painter, architect, and is considered to be the first art historian of our time, and authored an encyclopedia about art history, one on which our art history books are still based. He was the first author to use the word Renaissance, which means rebirth, in his writings. In this art history book, Vasari explains that while the Greeks saw artists as simply copying God's work, mimesis, and the Middle Evil rulers believed that artists were mere craftsmen, the Renaissance culture believed that artists were not only copying God, but they were actually godlike. This had great influence as to how people viewed art and how people viewed artists. For the first time, philosophers started to link creativity and intelligence. In the past, artists were viewed as lonely craftsmen, whose job descriptions could be summarized as imitators. But now, in the Renaissance, artists were seen as craftsmen, possessing great intellect. Not only could they imitate, but they could create. Artists became individuals, possessing creative powers. This shift in thinking led artists to move their learning out of their workshops, away from group efforts, embracing individual works, and they started to study at prestigious art academies created by Vasari and funded by the great Duke himself, the Duke of Medici. Not only were artists now almost godlike, they could improve on reality. They improved reality through their art. Artists started to express imaginary worlds and romanticizing the world around them. It was believed that in order to depict these visions of the world, an artist had to be somewhat neurotic or even manic. The idea of the mad genius was birthed and continued way into the Victorian age. This was an age where there was a great hunger for knowledge, a fascination with science, with nature, and the study of human behavior. Many Victorian scholars started writing books about the scientific origins of the so-called mad genius. Lombroso was one of these authors. In 1891, he published his book, The Man of Genius. He was determined to prove the connection between the genius and the madman. Lombroso claimed that certain great men of genius, like Shakespeare, Plato and Mozart, had a degenerate symptom, which he based on their longevity, their versatility and the level of their inspiration. He supplemented his research with the measurements of their skull, their facial angles and the volumes of their brain fluids. I truly wonder how he actually managed to measure their brain fluids. He continued to say that artists continually hovered between a state of insanity and a state of genius and were generally short and pale. Lombroso argued that women were really geniuses. He stated in his book, It is an old observation that while thousands of women apply themselves to music for every hundred men, there are still no single great woman composers. I think Lombroso neglected to acknowledge that women in those days were denied opportunities and were given no credit for their talent or for their work. This brings me back to Mozart. It is said that the sister of Mozart was also a great artist and could play the piano with great sensitivity and skill, but she lived in her brother's shadow most of her life. And finally, Lombroso, he claimed that insanity and genius therefore artists, were greatly impacted by both the weather and by the altitude, and went on to claim that countries needed to be hilly to give rise to lots of geniuses, and unfortunately that flat countries like Belgium or Holland were deficient of men of genius. Sorry Belgium and Holland. Even though this is good for a giggle, just a few hundred years ago this was embraced as popular thought and influenced the way that people saw artists and the artist role in society. These teachings really affected the perception on creativity and the artist. These are the thoughts that influenced your grandparents' grandparents and ultimately influenced your parents or how you see art and the role of the artists. Remember what Theodore Roosevelt said, the more we know about our past, 
the better prepared we are for the future. Throughout the centuries, these artists' myths have sparked spicy stories, adding to the mystery and the suspense around the art and the artist, and we still face many of these misconceptions today. In order to adopt a healthy, true and balanced view about the role of the artist, we need to address these myths. Although culture may differ, I want to share a word with my Dutch audience. And maybe you can relate to this in the part of the world where you live. When I immigrated to the Netherlands 30 years ago, my dad had warned me. Now remember, Sonia, the Dutch are very different to the African cultures. They are far more reserved and don't express their emotions that quickly. There's even a Dutch expression that goes, Doe gewoon, dan doe je gek genoeg. Freely translated, this means, just act normal and you'll be acting crazy enough. Oh, I embraced myself and prepared myself for the worst, as I am rather an expressive person. I arrived in the Netherlands on the 26th of June 1988. Does that date ring a bell to anyone? I'll give you a moment. Hmm, think hard. Is it coming back? 26th of June 1988, think, a team, a round ball, and the color orange, yes, that's right, I arrived in the Netherlands the day after the Netherlands had won the European football championships, and it sent the nation in a frenzy. I was so busy with my farewells and immigrating to Europe, I had not given football or sport or any other world event any thought at that time. You can imagine my shock when I stepped into the train at the airport and headed off to the central station in Amsterdam. The train was filled with dancing people. They were all dressed in orange, which is our national colour derived from the Royal House of Orange. Strangers were hugging and kissing each other. And I really thought my father had got his signals crossed, as even the African people were not that expressive and loud on public transport. To see a photo of how our football team was welcomed after their victory, you can scoot over to my podcast notes and check it out. They're on my website. It is quite something. They say that this was the biggest celebration in the Netherlands after Liberation Day. But let me get back to my saying. Do normal, dan doe je gek genoeg. Just act normal and you'll be acting crazy enough. I think many of us are stifled by this idea that we basically have two options. The one option be normal and the other option is be crazy. So basically that's it. You're either normal or you're crazy. What is your perception of an artist? What words do you connect with creativity? Is the fact that you want to be normal keeping you from a creative free life? Or have you avoided the arts because you don't want to be labelled as crazy or unstable? Or do you feel that you need to be a genius or extremely talented in order to make good art? And hence you feel yourself coming up short every time. Well, I have good news. I believe that artists don't need to be mad or a genius in order to make art. We just need to be human. No more human, no less human. Not a madman or a genius. But an artist is human. And being creative is something that makes us innately human. We are human. The good, the bad and the ugly parts. This makes us human. We feel, we express and we choose to create. Being an artist is all about being you. Finding your voice, finding your song, finding your color and expressing it. We have the awesome privilege of depicting and reflecting life, whether we are sitting in the valley or standing on the mountaintop. Start today. Decide that you and your art are important. Get out your brushes. Get out your paints. Get out your paper and get to work joyfully. I hope you've been able to learn that from the Greeks who did mimesis, copying life, to the Middle Ages, 
where they were craftsmen, working in groups, on to the Renaissance, where the guilds were formed and working under patrons and acquired great influence, and coming up to today, using our imaginations and being expressive and discovering that we don't need to be manic or extreme or unstable to make art, but that we just need to be beautifully human. There are many more myths that surround the artist. And in the next episode, I will share how these artist myths still influence us today. We will look at five artist myths that I still hear from artists and from audiences around the world. In order to become the artist you were meant to be, you first need to unravel any misconceptions or myths that you still may have about being an artist. At the end of next week's episode, I have written a special resource for you to download. I mentioned this in my intro. So make sure you stay tuned. The next episode is in the make and will be coming shortly. If you don't want to miss an episode, then subscribe to my Help I'm Artist podcast on iTunes. And I would appreciate it if you left a review. I would love to hear from you. I would love to hear your artist story and what you think about my podcast. And if you know of anybody in your life that needs to revamp their creativity or to start to embrace their creative dream, then please share this podcast with them. That's all for this episode. I hope you enjoyed yourself and I'll see you again next time. Bye for now.